may not look like it, but inside this complex is housed a huge multi-stage process that ensures clean, fresh drinking water for over 50% of the population of Sault Ste. Marie. Join me, your host, Aaron Alessandrini, and two of our friends, Greg Perro and Sandra Dewar, from the water treatment facility as we learn about what it takes to get your drinking water from the source to your glass. This is PUC's Day in the Life. So I'm here with Greg in the low lift area of the water treatment plant. Can you kind of give me a little bit of a rundown on what this room's for? We're standing on top of a raw water well. Water comes from Marshall Drive under gravity feet, flows in under here, and these pumps over here are, are low lift pumps. They supply water to the filters upstairs. Uh, water is fed into here from this other room behind us. And that's the intake room on that side? That's right. Uh, water is fed under gravity from Marshall Drive, pumped okay. from GoCap to Marshall Drive and flows in here under gravity into this well below us and these four pumps here are used to pump water up to the filter floor. This panel behind us is our emergency panel. It works under normal circumstances, but were we to lose power, this would supply power from the generator downstairs so we could keep making water. Perfect, so even when the power's out, you guys can still run? For a while. A time will come when we can't backwash a filter. That's basically what our one limitation. Okay. So we could probably run for several days without doing that though. And the backwashing, that's, we're gonna take a look at that in a little bit and that's, that's you have to do that on a scheduled basis, right? Normally we backwash filters every 24 hours every okay. depends everything in this water plant depends on how much water we're making right what our flow rate is okay the higher the flow the more water or the more chemicals we have to use the more often we have to backwash everything is increased in frequency or in amount based on how much water we're making but at the kind of flow rates we're at right now we could probably run for a couple of days without backwashing the filter. Not bad. And keep making water. So what's the next step in the process after this room? Well, first of all, the second motor you can see on top of these pipes mm -hmm. is a flash mixer for alum. Okay. So that's alum being our coagulant. Right. We add alum here, it reacts quickly, forms uh, what's called a pin flock. The pin flock is so small that you can't really see it. Right. From here it flows up to the flock tanks. Uh, the flock is formed in the flock tank and from there it flows to the filters and we can filter it out through the filters. So that's for removing particulate from the water? It's mostly turbidity, which is basically okay. the cloudiness of water. Right. Uh, the water coming in here is so clear, it looks crystal clear, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. So we add alum and it, it brings those that particulate matter into big enough pieces that we can figure uh, filter it out. And that's in this process, we add the alum here and then on the next stage, we end up filtering that out. In the next stage, we allow it to form pin flock and then we filter it out. Very cool. Well, let's go check that out. All right, so I'm here with Sandra in the uh, aptly named chemical room. I think when it comes to water treatment, this is sort of the part of the process that everybody has the most sort of, you know, issue with or concern with. So, I mean, let's take a look at it. So, we do have four chemicals that we use at the water plant. Um, we have aluminum sulfate, we have uh, chlorine gas, mm -hmm. phosphates, and soda ash. Okay. Um, in this area, this is the alum room, so it's one of the chemical rooms. And as Greg had said before, the alum is used for a coagulant, so it breaks or it puts puts together the flock and it lets the filters um, have something to filter down. Something so that's something to grab onto. So um, aluminum sulfate is one of the ministry mandated um, chemicals that we can use. Okay. And um, as you can see, I'm not sure if you can see, these are all the pumps that uh, we use to make sure that the aluminum sulfate goes into the little area. all the buttons I'm not allowed to touch. Correct. So the other chemical that we use is chlorine gas. Okay. And when you say the word chlorine, people kind of get a little yeah, scared. Yeah, I think everyone it. has that thought in their head of someone just, you know, dumping a big bucket of bleach or something into the water and it's not. You guys actually use a gas. Yes, we use a gas. So in the other room, um, we have two big tunners that we use uh, daily. Usually we use about 25 kilograms per day of chlorine for the amount of water that we're receiving from Lake Superior and going out into the system. And what it is used for is a disinfectant. Um, the ministry has mandated that disinfectants have to be used. Right. Chlorine gas is our um, chemical that we use and we a dose very small. So 
What we aim for is about 1.2 milligrams per liter. Okay. In the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot, but it's enough to get rid of any bacteria. The other uh, chemical that we have, which is in the room just across the hall, are the blended phosphates. And blended phosphates are rather the new chemical that we've introduced into the system. Uh, and that was for corrosion control. Right. Uh, we've had um, mandated, we had to have a corrosion control plan. And we use blended phosphates to make a coating on the inside of the pipe so nothing can slough off when the water is going back and forth. Right. So this that sort of piggybacks on the water and then just coats the inside coats of the, the pipe. Inside because, the you know, we've got a lot of older water systems in town. We do. We have a lot of uh, older piping and and uh, you can't just tear everything out of the city and replace it all at the same time. So um, that's one of the chemicals that's approved. Very safe. And if you look on things that are like in the grocery store, you can see that there's phosphates in a lot of the stuff that, that we're using. Okay. Um, but because of the lead issue that arose a couple of years ago, it's uh, right at the forefront of health matters. Exactly. We needed to do something to make sure the water is So safe. we do have a plan in place then that deals with that. So that's, yes, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And the last chemical that we have is soda. Um, but that's in the high lift area and okay. that goes out the only time that goes out is when we are high lifting so pumping the water out and the soda ash is used to balance the pH in the water um, a lot of people don't understand about pH it's a it's a really complicated process but all it is is it's how acidic or basic your water is we want the pH of the water to be as close to the number that we've chosen is between 7.4 and 7.6 okay. so that it stays that way into the entire process from one end of the city to the other and it doesn't rise or fall too dramatically because that's where you start to get problems like water quality concerns. Right, so do you, do you notice that it, it will change a bit in the different parts of the city, like while all this water is traveling? If we use what we're using now, yes. So a difference between the west end of the city used to be like 7.2 to the east end of the city, which would be like an 8. Wow. It doesn't seem that much, but it's a it's a it's big a difference, yes. And so, so now, this new soda ash that we're using has a greater tolerance for control. So now. we can control how much we leave the water coming out of here uh, for the pH and it will stay the same awesome. into the entire city. Very cool. yeah. Okay, so then after this, what's uh, after this, the chemical room, what's the next process? So after the chemical room, because it's, it's broken down, because the chemicals are injected at different areas, um, from this building right here, it would be upstairs to the filters into the high lift area. The filters, all right, let's go check out the filters. Okay. Sandra and I are in the filter room. How many actual tanks do you guys have in this? Four filters, four flock tanks. How much water do these tanks hold on average? So each filter holds about 115 cubic meters of water. Wow, okay. As Greg had said before, in the event that we don't have power to the building, we have our diesels downstairs that allow us to keep doing this process. Um, so we can hold quite a bit of water in here for the customers. So what happens, um, the alum was injected downstairs in the low left area and then it's pumped up to these flock tanks that are behind you. And the water goes through and spins, like we have a, a mixer in there and it, it's filtered through and all the particles are grabbed on from the filter and then it's the clean water or cleaner water goes through down into the high lift area. So let's take a look at what the fans do. So that, that sort of just sort of agitates the water? Yes, yeah. so it keeps it in constant motion. It doesn't let anything settle. And what happens in the flock tanks is that uh, the particles come together and then they're allowed to settle onto the filter so we can grab them and that doesn't go through to the water that goes to the customers at the very end. Okay, so then, so after it moves from the flock tanks in, into the filtering system, it gets to sit in them, you, you have like a, it's a gravity drain? It drains down, so the filtering valve is open so the water goes and it goes into a reservoir where okay. then it sits for a little while and then that's the process of turning the high lift pumps on and then getting to the customer. So I think you guys have a model actually of how the filters work. Would you? Take a look at that. Sure. So the model shows a cross section of what the filter looks like inside. And we are a dual media filter, which means we have two components to the filter. We have anthracite and we have sand. Um, they have different coefficients so they can trap things differently. Right. That's why it's dual. Um, so the model shows that um, the amount of anthracite is, that's in it is quite a bit more than the amount of sand and that's the way it was constructed. Okay. So uh, what happens is that the water comes in uh, from the flock tanks and it filters out. All of the particles are grabbed uh, by this media and the operators have the ability to backwash the filters on the schedule that they set. So usually it's between 24 and 48 hours. Okay, so the backwashing is just to clean the filter. Backwash and exactly clean it. So the water is reversed um, up through the media and all of the particles are brought up to the surface of the, um, the filter right. and they fall into the troughs and then out the drain. 
What, what is the part of the surface wash arm play? That plays a part when we're doing the backwash. So when the backwash happens, the surface wash arm goes around and it spins and it agitates all of the water that's inside the filter okay. and it creates all that flock comes up. Sort of bring everything up to the surface. It brings everything up to the surface. So that's why that's in the model there. And as you can see, all of the media is well below it. So the surface wash run arms isn't in the media because then it would get all clogged up with particulate, right? Is that what this, that's yes, the large that's, part up there? Yeah, the trough level. Awesome. So then everything kind of all the gooey bits to just flow in there the and then they go out. And so that doesn't go to the customer. So I'm here with Greg in what's called the high lift room. So this is basically the, the last area before the water gets out to the consumer. And uh, what you were saying before is that there's like three main kind of things that are happening in this in this uh, this room. If you want to, you know, tell me a little bit about those. That's correct. Uh, we have the high lift pumps, which are used to discharge water from the water treatment plant to the distribution system. Okay. We have three pumps down here. We'll pump uh, one pump will pump about thirty thousand cubic meters a day. We could run two, which would bring us up to about 48,000 cubic meters a day. We rarely have to run more than one high lift pump. And that's all the uh, sort of teal aqua colored pipes? Yes, uh, yeah, light blue is treated water. Okay. Yes. And these big tanks underneath here are surge tanks to absorb, absorb the shock of starting these pumps. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't put all of that pressure There's on the distribution on the, on the transmission main and cause a, a major main break. It's a lot of stress when the that's pumps correct. come on. On this side, we have our backwash pumps, which uh, supply water for backwashing the filters. These are actually the largest pumps in the building. Uh, they could pump as much as 600 liters per second through the filters, although we don't pump that much. We backwash at about 420 liters per second. Okay. Uh, and at the back of the building is our soda ash system, which we use to, I believe Sandra was talking about that, mm. to adjust the pH. Right. Now, all of that, the soda ash and the phosphates, and at one time, ammonia used to be injected at the far end of this header. Okay. And you guys have since no more adding ammonia. We're no longer adding ammonia. So they're all injected as it's discharged from the plant at that end. Of at the that station. Right? We also have our, our backup generator down here and a diesel pump that we talked about before so that we can... And that's down in this side too. Yes, okay. that's correct. So we can still make water and we can still pump water should we lose electricity. So let's go down and take a look at them. Sure thing. We're down here in the, the lower part of the, the high lift. That's correct. So behind us are the, the surge tanks, right? Now this is, so when the water leaves to go out to the people, this is this is the last last stop. That's right. Right here is, uh, behind that wall is our reservoir, holds about 14,000 cubic meters of water. When we start one of these high lift pumps, it'll draw water from the reservoir up here and pump it, pump it into that header. Okay. And the surge tanks are here to absorb the shock of that startup. It causes a big increase in pressure mm -hmm. and the sur surge tanks absorb that rather than applying it to the distribution system and potentially breaking our transmission main. Okay. That's the function of these here. This is our high lift number three, high lift number two, and the third one, high lift number one, is where we have our emergency pump if we were to lose power so we can still pump water and beside it is our backup generator. Awesome. So what's in the tank that allows it to work as a, as a shock It's half full of water and the other half is compressed air. Okay. And we monitor the level in that to keep it at that point so that the surge tank works effectively. So it almost adds like a, like a buffer. It's, it's like a shock absorber. All right, so next we have... The next would be the backwash pumps. Okay, so behind this is the, the backwash system, right? That's correct. Now, this is just a sole dedicated system specifically for just backwashing the filters? That's right. The, uh, either of these two pumps will backwash filter. We only ever backwash one filter at a time, so these draw their water from the reservoir, the okay. same as the high lift pumps do. And from here, it's pumped through a series of valves up to the specific filter that you want to backwash. Awesome. And now the next step, we've got the soda ash, right? That's correct. So take a look at that. Okay. So this is the last part of the high lift room, which is the soda ash. So kind of give me a rundown on what, what the soda ash is and what it's used for. Well, it comes into the building in powdered form in these large bags, and this system adds it to water, mixes it up uh, and to a specific concentration, and this other system behind me here delivers it to the discharge at the far end of the building along with the phosphates. Its role is to bring our pH from somewhere around 7.3 in the mm -hmm. reservoir to about 7.6 so that it matches 
the water in the rest of the distribution right. system. So in terms of the chemical additive process, this is the last thing that gets added yes. to the water before it gets out to the That's consumer. Correct. So here we've got the turbidity meter. So can you give me just sort of like a, a little bit of a definition of turbidity for the, for the people watching so you kind of understand what you mean. Well, turbidity is a measure of the clarity of the water. Uh, it's heavily regulated. Uh, the water comes into this uh, plant at about anywhere from 0.3 to 0.7 or 0.8 naphthalometric units or NTUs. Okay. Uh, you can't see that degree of turbidity until it reaches five NTUs. Okay. One NTU is what we're allowed to discharge from the filter, that is. If we exceed one NTU, we have to shut the filter off or that's an adverse. Okay. And we'd have to report it to the health unit and the Ministry of the Environment. Yeah. If on a monthly basis, we have to be below 0.3 NTUs mm -hmm. uh, on a monthly rolling average. These numbers, as you can see, are much lower. So when we're talking about what you can see... At 5 NTU, you could see slight lack of clarity in the water. Okay. At 3 or 4, you see nothing at all. It would look exactly the same. But we rarely exceed 0.1 NTU at the filter. Okay. And our, the water that we discharge from this water plant is usually about 0.05 NTUs. Right. So that's very, very clear. Like, this is a turbidity me meter of the type that we used to use in the past. We still have this one. These ones here, this is a brand new model and these are the control units for it. Now what stage of the water filtration process is this monitoring? This is, this is monitoring the water as it leaves the filter. As it leaves the filter. And we also use them to monitor the water coming in okay. and to monitor the water at the discharge. So we're constantly checking our water to see what the quality is. Turbidity and chlorine residuals are the two key things that we have to monitor on a regular basis. Even though we're fortunate enough to be able to take it from one of the cleanest sources of fresh water in the world, as you can see, it takes a lot to ensure that your water comes to you as the fresh, clean drinking water that you've come to expect. From the chemical processes that clean the water as it comes in, to the filtration process that strips away any of the residual particulates, there's quite a bit more going on behind the scenes when it comes to bringing it from the lake to your glass. Thank you for watching, and make sure to join us next time for more of PUC's Day in the Life, where we'll look into the dirty side of your water's life cycle as we explore and learn about the sewage treatment process in the city's wastewater treatment plant.